a topic that should be somewhat familiar to you guys by now. Uh, we've seen talks by Steve Frank and Simon Levin, which have hinted at a lot of these mechanisms. But I'm trained as an ecosystem ecologist. So what I really want to do today is try to <coughs> put the theory of public goods in, with microbes into a, a broader scale context and really look at some of the implications of this theory uh, that we've been talking about in terms of public goods. So to start out with that, I, I want to kind of make the link between uh, microbes and public goods and these, these larger scale processes that I tend to think about a lot. And there's really been a revolution lately in what we call microbial ecology, or the study of the diversity and distribution of microbes. So I'll, I'll just start out by defining what I mean by a microbe. It's probably fairly clear, uh, but I've gotten this question before. We're talking about small organisms here, uh, but more importantly, I think it, these are organisms that are interacting primarily with their environment at a small scale, at a chemical level. So in this definition, I would include organisms like bacteria and fungi and, and protists. Um, so these are pretty broad groups of, of organisms. And you can see that they're not entirely microscopic organisms. So here's a, a set of uh, fungal hyphae, or these, these root-like structures that fungi form. You can see this with your naked eye. These are fungi that are uh, symbiotically associated with plant roots that exchange carbon and nutrients <coughs> with those plant roots. And uh, here are some uh, staph bacteria in an electron microscope. So, these microbes, we now know uh, from the advent of molecular approaches in biology, are extremely diverse and extremely abundant in some cases. So if we go out to Aldrich Park and pull out a handful of soil, a handful of soil may hold uh, over a billion uh, different microorganisms within it, with a diversity of maybe a million or, or 100,000 different types of bacteria and fungi. So these, these organisms are extremely diverse. They're also highly diverse and abundant in, in the ocean as well as in terrestrial systems. And we literally find them everywhere around the world. So people have looked for them everywhere. Uh, people are looking for them on other worlds as well, of course. Um, but here on Earth, we find them you know, kilometers below the surface of the Earth, kilometers below the bottom of the ocean, in the bottom of the ocean, <coughs> all throughout the water column of the ocean, up in the atmosphere. So there's very little, there's very few places there truly sterile uh, on the planet. So what this means is the, the, these microbes are really important for kind of Earth system level processes. <clears throat> so here are some examples of the processes for which microbes are really important. And this is kind of the scale that I think about as an ecosystem ecologist. And this is the scale where I think could really benefit from some of the discussions that we're having about microbial public goods. So one of the things that, that microbes are heavily involved in is the global carbon cycle. And every ecosystem ecologist has to put this figure up at some point in their talk. This is a plot of CO2 concentrations over time since the late 1950s, showing the rise in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere due to human activities. And uh, this is a, a classic figure, but what we're really interested in is how, you know, how long is this pattern going to continue, and what are going to be the impacts on human societies and on other ecosystems. So part of making that prediction involves building models of the entire Earth system and getting right the biological components of those models. So right now, those models basically do not include any of the discussion that we're having uh, today and yesterday. The microbes are represented in a very abstract way in these Earth, Earth system models, so there wouldn't even be an opportunity to incorporate the interactions between different types of microbes or the evolutionary processes that, that we've been discussing as well. So I think there's a real demand and a real need to incorporate this type of information into these models. Uh, secondly, microbes are vastly important for a number of other processes that contribute to human well-being. <coughs> um, they, they return nutrients back into an ecosystem, which is really important for soil fertility and agriculture. And they're also important uh, sources of bio, biomolecules and important in drug discovery. So they have economic, direct economic implications. <coughs> and one of the things that I think is really uh, curious to think about uh, with these microbes is that if we look out across the landscape, you know, you see a lot of uh, living plants, and to think that without the microbes in ecosystems, <coughs> all of this living material would, would have no way of being returned back into uh, other forms. So there has to be some mechanism by which 
biomass, the living material in organisms, is recycled uh, into the environment. And that's a process that's really fundamentally driven by microbes. And that's the process I really want to focus on today and put that into uh, and relate that to the, the topic of public goods. So really focusing on the ecosystem consequences of public goods, because we now know that there's a lot of good theory out there. There's a lot of understanding of the evolutionary processes that regulate the production of public goods and competition for public goods. So what I want to do is focus on an example, which is the production of what I'll call extracellular enzymes, and I'll, I'll show you that system in a moment. <clears throat> this is a basic example of microbial, a microbial public good, and in this sense I'm talking about something that we would call a common resource pool. Something that has a benefit, uh, potentially for the entire population, and a cost that's borne by an individual microbe. So I'll talk about a theoretical model that I developed for the system, which should be pretty familiar by now. Um, I'll talk about some experimental data that I've been uh, generating in the laboratory to try to test this model. And I'll go on to explain some of the ecosystem consequences of this, of this public good system. And then I'll kind of uh, go quickly through this at the end because we've heard a lot about this already. Some of these other microbial public goods that may also have ecosystem level consequences. Okay, so what are extracellular enzymes? <clears throat> well, these are biological molecules, catalysts basically, produced by microorganisms. So here we have a <coughs> cartoon bacterium. And what the bacterium does is to release one of these enzymes or secrete one of these enzymes outside of its cell that goes and interacts with some chemical compounds. This is a, a chemical compound that's represented or made up of smaller units, monomers, and the enzyme goes out and breaks apart this more complex molecule into a smaller molecule that the microbe can then take up and bring into its cell for metabolism and energy and, and resource availability. So again, this is a, a public goods problem because <clears throat> this enzyme involves a specific cost to the microbe and it provides a benefit outside of the microbe's body where it can't necessarily control where that benefit goes so that other microbes could then intercept uh, that, that reaction product. So this is a really important process for the microbe because it's how the microbe is obtaining resources. It's how it obtains energy from the environment. And like I said, the environment is full of these polymers. <clears throat> you know, the majority of the, the molecules made by living biomass, plants, animals, microbes, is in polymeric form. It's not in the simple form that microbes can just use. Okay, so that's really important for the individual microbe, but it's also important at the kind of ecosystem level, so the, the level of the entire Earth system, in fact. Because this is what we believe to be the rate-limiting step in the cycling of nutrients and carbon back into the ecosystem in, in available forms. Like I said, without this step, this material would accumulate in the biosphere and there'd be no mechanism for returning it into forms that living organisms can use. <clears throat> so, what this means then is that these kind of microbial economic processes and public goods really can have uh, consequences at the ecosystem level. And we should potentially consider them when we're trying to understand the entire Earth system. <coughs> so we could use these, these, uh, this understanding to improve Earth's systems. <coughs> okay, so I started out uh, a few years ago developing a fairly simple uh, model <coughs> to try to understand the interactions between uh, different types of microbes. And this, is, this stemmed from the, the recognition that evolution would lead potentially to cheaters evolving in systems where we have these types of common resource public goods. So here's the basic conceptual model, and I put this onto a spatial grid. So this is a, an agent-based, individual-based model. So there's spatial structure within the model, and I allow for two microbial types, these enzyme producers, and what I'm calling cheaters. So they're basically equivalent, but they don't, they don't produce the extracellular enzyme. So they can carry out basic microbial processes, biological processes, of metabolism and reproduction. So the cells will divide once they reach a certain threshold size. <clears throat> and then they can move uh, across the grid by parameters I can specify here. They can move to adjacent grid cells or they can move farther away if we are trying to specify a broader uh, neighborhood or environment. And within the system we have 
chemical parameters as well. So we have the substrates for enzyme activity, those complex polymers that break down the enzymes themselves, as well as these more simple products. Is it just one type of individual in a cell? That's right, yeah. So the, the state of each grid cell can be either producer, cheater, or empty. So this system, we have constant inputs of substrate, so you know, kind of assuming that plants are growing and providing these complex substrates over time. <clears throat> so entering the grid at a certain rate. <coughs> then we have uh, production of enzymes <coughs> by the enzyme producers. And these enzymes can then diffuse throughout this grid uh, at a rate dependent on our diffusion parameters. And these, these enzyme producers <coughs> can also regulate how much of this enzyme they produce. So the model specifies a kind of minimum amount of enzyme that they must produce. <clears throat> but then they can produce more than that if they have a demand for the resource or the substrate that uh, is available here. So there is some level of control over how much is produced. So the enzyme, once it diffuses across the grid or to its location on the grid, can catalyze the degradation or the breakdown of the substrate into products. And then both enzyme producers and cheaters can take up that, that more simple product. So that's a basic representation of the system. Okay, so the first thing you might think about is, well, you know, how far should these enzymes move away from the enzyme producers, even in the absence of, of competition? So this is just a representation of a single enzyme producer at the center of a 100 by 100 grid. And so this grid is also formed as a torus. So these, again, these edges wrap around. This edge is contiguous with that one. And so here's a <coughs> prediction of the concentration of that, that simple product that the microbes can take up. So more red colors are higher product concentrations. And this is a function of the diffusion rate of the enzyme. So what you can see here is that the highest <coughs> product concentrations over this interval of time form at the intermediate rate of enzyme diffusion. So basically what that means is if enzyme diffusion is too restricted, then the microbes enzymes can't reach very far out on the grid. They're stuck close to the microbe. They rapidly break down all the substrate available there and run out of that substrate so there's not as much product being formed. They become substrate limited. Oh, I should mention that the, the catalysis reaction, the, the equation that governs the uh, relationship between reaction rate and substrate concentration is a saturating function. It's called the michaelis menten equation. This is a very standard uh, equation to use in biochemistry to describe enzyme activity. <clears throat> so going back to this, if the diffusion rate of the enzyme is really high, then the enzyme goes basically all across the grid very rapidly and starts breaking down uh, substrate across the grid, but the microbe is still located in the middle, so it's not able to take up the, this product very rapidly. So the highest concentrations, the highest basic resource returns at these intermediate levels. <clears throat> now, furthermore, this kind of optimal foraging radius or optimal diffusion parameter depends on the substrate concentration. So what this graph shows is the, the growth rate of that microbe versus the enzyme diffusion rate again here, where we have low diffusion here, high diffusion here. And these are lines that represent different substrate concentrations. So here we have the low substrate concentration in the dashed line and the circles, and the highest substrate concentration here in the black, uh, black squares and line. <clears throat> so you can see the, the optimal or the maximal growth rate shifts from higher diffusion to lower diffusion as substrate concentration increases. Yeah? Is the No, sorry, the, the substrate is basically immobile in this in this case. So I'm assuming that it's Even a after it's been sliced and the and the sugar can fall down No, the sugars then can diffuse at a rate which is faster than the enzyme. Way faster. Well, yeah. I don't know if I'd say way faster. Maybe. More volatile. Yeah. yeah. Proportional to their difference in size. So the, the the sugar tends to run away from the That's right. So what this graph is basically showing is that if the microbe is sitting on top of its substrate and there's a large amount of the substrate there, the best strategy is to keep the enzyme as close as possible because you're not going to run out of the substrate because there's a large amount of it and you're sitting right on top of it. But if the substrate is somewhat uh, dilute and diffused across the entire grid, then it makes sense 
to have a strategy where the enzyme goes farther out to access that substrate and uh, build up the product concentrations higher across the entire grid. Okay, so let's look at some of the, the dynamics here that occur when we have uh, cheaters present in the, in the population as well as the enzyme producers. So this is a result that kind of echoes what we've heard before um, about the effect of spatial structure and the, the effects of kin on uh, the success or the coexistence of these different uh, types. So basically if we have low rates of enzyme diffusion, we ultimately see coexistence between the cheater and producer populations. So the red, red line is the population size of cheaters, the black line is the producers. Whereas if we have a, a well-mixed system, or a mean-free field, is that what you called it, Simon? Mean field. Mean field, yeah. So this is the, the mean field situation, where we get this dynamic where <coughs> the enzyme producers <coughs> initially grow, but because the cheaters are not paying the cost of enzyme production, their populations increase more rapidly, and then they ultimately outcompete the enzyme producers, which results in the entire system collapsing. Okay, so this is basically the um, second version of the hawk dove uh, payoff matrix that Simon discussed earlier today. So this is nothing new as far as um, you know, spatial dynamics and uh, theory in terms of public goods. But what we see is some interesting <coughs> oscillations occurring at these intermediate diffusion rates. <coughs> we get an initial increase in producer populations followed by an increase in cheater populations but before the entire system can collapse, the, the cheaters have declined enough that the producers can then recover and start to grow again. So we get this oscillation that occurs over time. And I'll show you on the grid in a second how that happens. <clears throat> Furthermore, the system also, of course, depends on the cost of enzyme production, as you might expect. So if we, if we reduce those costs, <clears throat> then the, we see much greater success by the enzyme producers. So again, the enzyme producers in the black line. All the same levels of diffusion here, but we get uh, dominance, much stronger dominance by the producers uh, when the enzyme costs are lower. So basically this is allowing the producers to, to much better regulate their, their level of enzyme production. Even in this uh, mean field scenario, we're still seeing some at least temporary coexistence between the populations. So what's actually happening on, this, on the spatial grid, I think this is potentially a representation of what might happen on you know, the surface of a plant leaf that's decomposing, for instance. So on the left here, we have the populations. The gray is empty, the cheaters are in red, and the producers are in yellow. <coughs> and what you can see here is that the, you know, the cheaters are dependent on the producer colonies to produce enzymes and release the, the products. So they're occurring around the producers, but ultimately out competing them locally and driving them to extinction. Except in these, in these cases where by you know, some random events, there's some stochasticity built into the model, the producers can <coughs> escape from these, these sort of prisons, colonies, and then recolonize the empty portions of the grid, which are abundant in substrate, poor in product, and represent uh, an advantage in growth for the enzyme producers. But the key here for the kind of ecosystem level is that these areas that are empty or devoid of producers are areas where we're getting low product formation and low turnover of that substrate. <clears throat> now remember, that process of substrate turnover is what prevents you know, the world filling up with you know, dead, dead plant material and biomass. So it's only in these areas where we see producer colonies that we have high product concentrations. So even though we see coexistence in this system, or oscillations in some cases, even if there is the, the ability for the producers to co-occur, we still see a lower uh, production or a lower functioning of this of this ecosystem in terms of product formation. Mm -hmm. What's the use of the dispersal of the, of the bacteria? So, so they're growing, they're making it very sufficient, and then do they just grow locally and spread out like a, like a, a colony, or do they, yes. do they have some dispersal like that? Like um, well, you, you, the model could, could Assume either, but in, the, in these simulations, it's local. Yeah. And, and basically, the, if you allow them to um, disperse across the entire grid, you get that mean field yeah. scenario on the right that I showed before. Okay, so this is what we get from the models, and 
What we wanted to do is try to directly test this um, model prediction in the lab. So we've been in the process of obtaining some bacterial strains that we could use to test such a model. So uh, we obtained from another lab uh, a strain of Pseudomonas fluorescens, which is sort of an interesting, <coughs> interesting bacterium. Uh, this is a, a microbe that you might find in the soil. Uh, you might also find it in, in sour milk. Um, if you open up your milk container and it's, it's spoiled, this organism was probably involved. <coughs> Produces a range of different extracellular enzymes, including protein degrading enzymes and lipid degrading enzymes. So the, the best components of milk are proteins and lipids. It and forms, forms biofilms. It also, aeruginosa forms biofilms. So does fluorescence. Um, although we're actually doing some experiments now with biofilms and finding it hard to get this particular strain of fluorescence to make a biofilm, but that could just be our environmental conditions. Anyway, um, it produces an enzyme called protease, which breaks down the proteins in milk. And uh, the lab we obtained this from uh, developed a protease knockout or a strain of the bacterium that, that is not able to produce the protease enzyme. So we're using that as our cheater. So genetically, they should be pretty much identical except for the, the lack of protease in the cheater. So our initial experiments have focused on the well-mixed scenario. So we've been using flasks like these. And uh, these are these greenish colors are derived from <coughs> high growth of the bacterium. Pseudomonas also produces siderophores. And this uh, greenish color uh, actually is derived from the, the production of siderophore. And if you put these under ultraviolet light, they'll actually glow because it, it's a fluorescent siderophore. So that's why it's called pseudomonas fluorescence. So this is potentially a good uh, study system for a number of different public goods. So we want to study uh, the growth of, this, of these strains on uh, two different types of media. One that requires <coughs> enzyme production for the strains to, to uh, grow efficiently, and one that was kind of a positive control. So we had a medium that has some basic uh, growth components, sucrose and asparagine, that, that both strains could take up. Uh, but the bulk of the resource in here was casein, which is a protein derived from milk. So the enzyme producers uh, could make enzymes that, that release the energy and nutrients in that compound. And then we also took this media and we enzymatically pre-hydrolyzed it, broke it down, and uh, converted this casein into its end products. So theoretically then the cheaters should be able to grow equally well on that media type. And this is work that I've done in collaboration with my uh, my lab has some undergraduates. <clears throat> okay, so here are some data. Um, what I'm showing you here is optical density as a function of time. So optical density is basically just a measure of biomass, the you know, amount of cells in the, the media. So in the red we have the cheaters grown by themselves, in the blue we have producers grown by themselves, and the purple is a 50-50 initial mixture of the two strains. And this is shown on the casein-containing medium, so the medium that requires enzymatic activity to, for growth. So you see there is some growth of the cheaters on this medium, and they're growing on the simple components that were already present there. But they don't reach as high a level of biomass as the producers do when they are grown alone, because they, somewhere around 24 hours, start producing enzyme activity that allows them to access that, that complex casein substrate. Now, if we look at the two in competition, uh, you see that the, the biomass doesn't reach the same level as it does for the producers alone, even though both strains are present in that media. And we can actually, because- That's the, that's the total biomass over- Yeah, the, yeah, the total biomass. The two so we were interested to see, well, well, are the cheaters actually dominating the system? There's not statistical evidence for that. It looks like they're about the same abundance. Now, You'll note that this is not exactly what the model predicts, right? We see that there is an effect of the cheaters on the producers because the, the competition growth is, is less than the producers alone. But again, this is not exactly the same system. This is a batch, a single flask that we add some substrate to, <coughs> and we let the bacteria grow in that flask because it shakes over time. But we don't add anything else to it. Whereas in the model, it's more like a continuous system where there's continuous addition of substrate. So, the way we could really test that model better, I think, is by taking you know, the strains somewhere around here and then transferring them into a new flask where they have new substrate available, and then we should see this entire 
uh, kind of evolutionary dynamic play out where we get you know, the elimination of the producers over time. But initially, there is definitely a difference there in terms of growth. Well, it, it looks like casein doesn't help anybody until uh, after a, a day and a half or something. Yeah, yeah. It looks well, like it takes that long for the enzyme system to be fully upregulated. Mm -hmm. It's sort of surprising to me. But. So then we did the, the comparison of the positive control. So this is the media that's been completely hydrolyzed, or we, we hope it's completely hydrolyzed. Um, and you can see here that the total amount of growth is actually higher. The scale here goes up to 1.5 instead of 1.2. So all the strain, all the, all the cultures grow rapidly, and they grow to a high level. Um, but there is actually still a statistically significant effect of the, of the um, particular culture here. Uh, so if we look also at the abundance distribution. It looks like the, the producers are actually doing a little bit better um, in this media type than we would have expected. So this could be for a number of reasons. Maybe we didn't completely break down that substrate as we thought we did. Or maybe there's actually some cost, some slight cost to being a cheater, um, which wouldn't invalidate our earlier results. It would actually make those results more conservative. So the cheater is supposed to have, you know, uh, be paying much less cost. If they were paying slightly more cost than we expected, that would make our earlier conclusion more conservative. Could you say again, is this well mixed or is this a... This is well mixed, yeah. Right now we're doing the, the experiments where we have a static system. We eventually want to do it on a system, like you mentioned earlier, uh, with, the, with the gel, where we really try to restrict diffusion. Okay, so what happens in terms of enzyme production? Is that consistent with what we predict from the model? Here's the activity of the, the protease enzyme, so the enzyme that breaks down the proteins. And we have that in the same, in the same cultures. Cheaters uh, basically don't produce any here. The producers uh, produce the enzyme at a fairly high level. But in the competition experiments, we see a pretty dramatic and significant reduction of enzyme activity. So somehow the cheaters, the presence of the cheaters is, is skimming off the resources that the producers would need to, to make this enzyme. If you look at the hydrolyzed media positive control, um, there's, again, somewhat of a, a difference here, more than we would have expected, but overall, um, the activities are still higher in the enzyme uh, producers. There's some activity by the cheaters, which there shouldn't be, but the, the possibility here is that they have an internal enzyme that is somehow getting released into the media when they're growing at very high rates. Maybe they have some other enzyme that wasn't reported in the initial studies with this strain. So this is what happens when you start to go into the, the more real world, <laughs> and that sometimes the strains don't necessarily um, fit exactly with your model assumptions. But at least we're getting some patterns that are suggestive of what we would predict. So the more relevant question is, you know, moving beyond just a, a flask, you know, how important are these mechanisms in nature? And in, in terms of trying to pursue these ideas, I've gotten uh, you know, feedback from a number of reviewers saying, well, this is, this is great theory and this is you know, interesting uh, model system, but I don't really believe that cheating actually happens in, in nature, which is fair enough. There are reasons, evolutionary reasons, why it might not, why you might get coexistence, why um, communities may evolve in ways that, that prevent cheating or mitigate cheating. So I'm going to go out into a more complex community and see potentially if this is, is happening or not. So to do that, um, at least initially, <clears throat> we just want to go out and characterize where these enzymes are occurring in the natural environment. So in collaboration with some other professors here at UCI, uh, we've been sending undergraduates out to Newport Pier, which is just, just off the coast here, three times per week to sample water from the surface ocean and bring it back to the lab where we will analyze the enzyme activity in different fractions of that water. So you may say, water, what do you mean fractions? Well, it turns out that ocean water isn't just water. There's a lot of biomass, a lot of material in there. <clears throat> so this material is, is what we would call marine snow because it looks kind of like, almost like a snowstorm here. But this is basically uh, dead, <coughs> dead material, dead phytoplankton, dead zooplankton, the, these extracellular polysaccharides that are produced by biofilm forming bacteria in some cases. So it's a range of different particles of different sizes. And what this provides us is an opportunity to look at environments with different diffusion properties. <clears throat> so basically, out here in the, 
you know, kind of open water, there's relatively high diffusion rates, whereas on the surfaces of these particles and in these extracellular gels, there's potentially lower diffusion rates. So we may expect these different environments to favor different enzyme strategies. Okay, so here uh, are some data from the past year or so uh, on the activity of a peptidase enzyme. And peptidase is very similar to protease. Uh, it's also involved in breaking down proteins that would occur naturally in the ocean in this case. And this is a, a leucine amino peptidase. <coughs> so it attacks the part of uh, a protein structure that contains leucine. So what you see here are some interesting patterns that occur over time, uh, which I won't go into right now, but also some pretty dramatic differences in the activity in these, in these distinct fractions. So what we have here are lines that correspond to unfiltered water. So this is the blue line. And in the red line, we have water that's been pushed through a 2.7 micron filter. And the black line, water that's been pushed through a 0.2 micron filter. So the significance of this is that bacterial cells are about one micron in diameter. So bacterial cells will pass through the 2.7 filter, but not the 0.2 filter. <clears throat> so the black line is basically the material that passes through all these filters. So there's no bacteria in there. It's only freely dissolved enzymes and viruses and, and other dissolved compounds that would get through that filter. Whereas the, the difference between the blue line and the red line is the material that's trapped on a filter that's larger than 2.7 microns. <clears throat> so these big, big chunks of extracellular material occurring in the ocean. And what this tells us is that the vast majority of the activity of this enzyme is bound to something. It's not just freely released out into the ocean water. It's bound mainly, in this case, onto these larger particles. And it may be that there's bacteria bound onto the larger particles, and then the two, you know, the, the bacteria are making enzymes to break down those large particles. Relatively little, there is a measurable fraction, but it's small, is uh, actually bound onto cells that are freely floating around in the ocean. <coughs> This kind of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint, right? Because, you know, what benefit would you obtain by just letting an enzyme uh, freely be released into the ocean water column? You're very unlikely to see a product of that uh, enzymatic reaction. Which is why it was really surprising to find this. <laughs> so this is the activity of phosphatase. And phosphatase is an enzyme that releases phosphorus from organic compounds. It's really important because in a lot of the ocean, although not here at our site probably, in a lot of the ocean, phosphorus is a limiting nutrient to the growth of phytoplankton, the, the small plants that live in the ocean. So with, with this looks, you know, this looks kind of messy, and that's because all of these fractions are, are overlapping, which basically means that all of the activity is freely dissolved in, in the water column. So somehow this enzyme is being released out into the broader water column, which doesn't really make sense to me, at least, from uh, an evolutionary perspective. Because now the benefits of this reaction could be just shared amongst all of the members of the ocean community. <clears throat> so why might this happen? Well, one possibility is that uh, you know, these enzymes are somehow released uh, rather rapidly after they're you know, secreted. So initially they're, they're bound to something, but then they're, they're rapidly released, or maybe they're um, intracellular enzymes and then the microbes die and those are released out into the water column. Or maybe this enzyme is just really resistant to breaking down. So, you know, it serves its purpose on the surface of a microbe and then when the microbe dies, that enzyme just stays around basically forever and ends up dissolved in, in the water column. Uh, the final possibility is that the microbes actually do secrete this enzyme out into the water column. <coughs> and the only way I could think of for this to, to make sense is that microbes are producing these enzymes because they need something, right? They need phosphorus in this case if they're producing this enzyme. So if you're a microbe and you need phosphorus, you're gonna make an enzyme, and that enzyme is a protein. Proteins are extremely rich in two elements, carbon and nitrogen. They contain very little phosphorus. So from a resource allocation standpoint, if you're limited by phosphorus, what should you do? Well, you can invest the resources you have, which are carbon and nitrogen, into this enzyme and e export it out into the environment to try to get a chance at some more phosphorus. So essentially, production of phosphatase could be free 
to these microbes because this resource is not limiting their growth and metabolism. Carbon and nitrogen is not limiting it. Phosphorus is limiting. And you can get phosphorus by investing carbon and nitrogen. <clears throat> so maybe it's a resource allocation mechanism that allows microbes to kind of be you know, promiscuous with the production of phosphatase activity. What's the entropy ratio of these microbes? The bacteria? Uh, bacteria probably around 15 to 1, 10 to 1 NP. They contain... Standard red right Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. Their NDPs are probably like, like Redfield. They're definitely tighter C to nutrient than Redfield, but... So Redfield is the, the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, of basically elements um, in the different pools of biomass in the ocean. And it's been observed to be fairly consistent across broad ocean basins. So about 106 to 16 to 1 is the kind of standard quoted ratio from the 1950s. So these organisms need elements like carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus in particular ratios. It's not like they can just completely substitute one for the other. They need to have them in certain ratios to build their biomolecules. <clears throat> so that's why you can be limited, and depending on the supply of those nutrients from the environment, you could be limited by one or the other, and use enzymes as a way to acquire the ones that you need by kind of re reinvesting resources into enzyme production. That is also incorporated in the model that I showed you earlier, but I left that, that stoichiometry part out just for simplicity. Um, so I was hinting at some future experiments that, that we're planning or working on right now. Um, we want to do these experiments with limitation of diffusion, so we could do, run them on you know, auger or some other medium that restricts diffusion. Um, we could, we want to do them over, over longer time periods where we're transferring the cultures from flask to flask to allow them more, more time to develop those dynamics we expect to see. Um, we'd also like to start looking at the genomic component of this work. So there's a lot of bacterial genomes available online now, probably more than 1,200 today, and it goes up by you know, 100 every couple of weeks. Or we could sequence particular genes in strains, <coughs> in strains that we isolate from the ocean. So we can look for the presence or absence of different enzymes, and if we have some markers that tell us whether the organism is a cheater or producer, we can start to look for those in our different water fractions. Um, finally, what I want to talk about next is trying to, to put this in a broader scale Earth system context and thinking about uh, how these microbes might be affecting the export of carbon from the surface ocean. Let me just talk about that for a second. And this work was really inspired just recently uh, by a paper by Trying et al, um, which was published on something called uh, Simpson's Paradox, which maybe the statisticians in here are familiar with. Uh, so we saw this, this uh, publication where uh, there's a public goods system. <clears throat> so the authors set up a you know, kind of classic public goods system, which they tested uh, with the E. coli bacteria in the lab. And what they observed was this, this phenomenon where if you start out <coughs> with an equal proportion of cheaters and public goods producers, eventually you can end up with a higher frequency of the producers, even in a well-mixed system. So what, what was happening here? Well, basically what can happen is if you put this system through some kind of bottleneck <coughs> where you take the, the, met, the global population and somehow divide it up statistically sample it into much smaller subpopulations, then you get this phenomenon here. So say, you know, through random chance, we seed these subpopulations with different frequencies. So the frequency of producers here is 0.75, it's higher. <coughs> the frequency here is 0.25, cheaters are dominating here. And in this system, the growth of the entire subpopulation is dependent on the frequency of the producers. So in this subpopulation, the entire uh, community grows at a higher rate because it has more producers, and in this one it grows at a lower rate. But what you see in each of these individual populations over time is what you'd expect from the, from the theory. <clears throat> the frequency of cheaters is increasing in all of these individual subpopulations. But when you take the weighted average of all of these, because this one is bigger, you end up with a global population that has a higher proportion of producers. And so you can continue this cycle by resampling this uh, global population and putting it through this bottleneck 
continually until you get you know, some equilibrium level of producers. So this is a really interesting system, and they, and they showed this in the lab by taking uh, you know, the, these, these producers and putting them through a bottleneck on a 96-well plate and tracking that over many generations. But we thought, what, what if this is happening in the surface? So, is that, just so I understand, is that an effect like what I was describing with Mixoma, namely that the less virulent types might be losing within every patch, but overall, because their patches do better? Yes. I think I think it's yeah I think it's been popping up all over the place. Turing's paradox is probably yeah. one. the probability of a hand uh, that occurring is high. Yeah. So I mean, but nonetheless, things like this get published in Science like every every couple of weeks. It also the bottom line just free the So yeah, yeah. these are all the standard things. Yeah. yeah there's but no the like. Toxin, but it's very interesting that you actually observe it. Yeah. Empirically. Yeah, they, I think they, the, the yeah. contribution here is they came up with a very well-crafted system where they could really see yeah, it sure. biologically. So, which is great. Yeah, I think that's great too. But what I would care about more is what's the biogeochemical implication of that system? You know, what, how does that affect the Earth system as a whole? So, a little bit about uh, oceanography. I'm not an oceanographer. I'm trying. I'm collaborating with oceanographers. Uh, but this is basically what happens in the ocean. Uh, we have atmospheric carbon dioxide, which we care about for uh, climate change reasons. And that's coming into the surface ocean. There are small plants called phytoplankton that take up that CO2 and uh, in the process of photosynthesis, so there's light in the sun driving this whole process. They also take up nutrients from the surface ocean. They build their biomass. <clears throat> but then ultimately, these plankton die. And a lot of the nutrients in the surface ocean are tied up in living biomass at any given time. So again, there needs to be a mechanism to release those nutrients back into the system. So enzyme producers, hetero, what we call heterotrophic bacteria, bacteria that live off of the carbon in, in dead organisms, um, break down these dead phytoplankton. So we thought, well, what would happen if we have these, this kind of global population of cheaters and producers floating around in the surface ocean and that occasionally colonize these, these chunks of dead phytoplankton? So will that then affect the rate of degradation of these dead cells? <clears throat> so basically, if we have you know, more enzyme producers, we're going to have a faster degradation of that dead phytoplankton. If we, have, if we happen to see that, that particle with more cheaters, we're going to have a slower degradation rate. That dead cell is going to make it deeper down into the ocean. So I've represented you know, surface ocean and deep ocean box here. And this is really important because you know, if you're in the surface ocean, that, that carbon dioxide that's released can then exchange with the atmosphere. <clears throat> so what happens in here doesn't really matter so much from a, a global carbon balance standpoint. But if you export carbon below you know, what's called the thermocline, the, basically the, the boundary between warm surface water and much colder deep water, if you get the particles down there, or even all the way down to the ocean sediments, you're talking thousands of years before that carbon, or that CO2 even, is going to uh, be exposed to the atmosphere. So this is basically a way of burying carbon in the ocean. <clears throat> it's called the biological pump. And this is called export productivity, when the carbon is exported below the surface ocean. And people really don't know mainly what the factors are that control the level of export production in different ecosystems, different ocean ecosystems. So we're wondering if this mechanism could be important for that. <clears throat> And unfortunately, we haven't done the simulations yet. We have, I have some collaborators who are you know, working out the, the models. But you know, things we can vary in this system include you know, the dispersal and the adhesion rates of this global population and the, the role of mixing in the surface ocean, which is a physical process you know, driven by waves and things like that. So we want to know, you know how does this biological mechanism and, the, and, these, and how do these public goods potentially affect this really important uh, boundary between uh, carbon sequestration and carbon loss back to the atmosphere. But in regard to cycling, isn't the ultimate question is, even if it takes a very long time for it to come out of equilibrium, there is some coming out and that would be a balance. So the only way in which this would be important is if the change in atmospheric CO2, which is a perturbation to the system, is pushing the system out of equilibrium so you're no longer getting a balance. 
Well, yes. I mean, whatever, no, yeah. Just because it takes a long time for it to come out, presumably, you, this right, is we're not been changing. Out for a very yeah, long yeah. Time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so unless, you're, unless you're talking about the response of the system to a perturbation, right. Which, well, the, which is reasonable to do, mm -hmm. then it's hard to see what. The, right. Well, so there's a there's a lot of things that are changing in the ocean right now, and you mentioned the okay. one, the, the direct CO2 forcing. So okay. that could anything that changes that. So first, we got to understand the, how that dynamic works, and then anything that alters it could potentially okay. well, but, but how does Steve's argument change if, if the global ocean is in equilibrium, but there's a lot of, which there is, um, heterogeneity in terms of spatial energy. Spatial energy in terms of upwellings and things of that sort. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I, 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 was, I was just trying to ask what the context is, because sort of first simple mind view, which I know isn't true, is that things would be in balance, and so that the fact that it stays down a long time doesn't mean anything, it's only right. heterogeneity or perturbation. Right, but they're only going to be in balance over the world scale. I mean, it's sort of the Hutchinson's argument for the coexistence of plankton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of stochasticity. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't making a specific argument. What I wanted yeah. to know is that there, must, there needs to be another piece. Right, and, and you know, some, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily frame it this way, but a lot of people are saying, well, you know, what kinds of things can we do to the ocean to make it bury more carbon? Yeah. So that's that's the kind of perturbation that, that we would apply to it. So first you need to understand it, and then you need yeah. to know the perturbations too. Yeah, and we probably will do those perturbations when we run the models oh. to, make, you know, to make that link. Uh, it's less than 1%. So 99% of the time, yeah. Yes. Probably more like 99.9, .9, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. You mean 99.9 .9 short term perspective of the atmosphere? Yeah, short term. 100% of the perspective of the atmosphere. Well, that's debatable because we have things like fossil fuels, so that, that's because. Well, micro 100 million, 300 million. Right. But yeah, but that's, I mean, now you're talking the scale of the entire. So it's kind of logarithmic. Yeah, but in terms of the climate problem, time scales of a thousand years, even which are nothing on geological okay. scales, are, are still important. So anyway, I'm, I'm anxious to get <coughs> working on this this system, and, and this workshop has inspired me to really go for this <laughs> pretty soon. Um, so now this may be a little anticlimactic at this point, but yeah, you know, I just want to go through some of the other microbial public goods that, that we've discussed and mentioned some more of the ecosystem level implications of these systems. So um, Steve, as well as Simon, talked about siderophores, which are these small chemicals that uh, bacteria, but as also fungi and plant roots, uh, will produce <coughs> to acquire metals from the environment. So you know, they'll, they'll read the siderophores. And, and this, this figure actually represents some potential competition for different siderophores among the, the roots and the fungi and the bacteria. But at the, at the global scale, what we're talking about here you know, is really quite important because these siderophores are necessary you know, for acquiring metals involved in nitrogen fixation as well as this, this process of carbon uptake. <coughs> so they're, they're the enzymes that fix nitrogen from, oh, okay, yeah, I'm almost. So the enzymes that fix nitrogen require these metals. And this nitrogen, of course, uh, supplies and in an available form that, that plants and, and living organisms can use. So without, without bacteria that, that can acquire uh, you know, metals through these siderophores, you wouldn't see this fixation of, of nitrogen. Furthermore, uh, the ocean, it turns out, is very, in many places, very much limited by the availability of iron. <clears throat> so without these siderophores, productivity of the ocean could potentially be much lower. And there's actually been some experiments uh, in the late 90s or so where people tried to fertilize patches of the ocean with iron to try to stimulate this productivity and this export production of buried carbon. It didn't work so great. It was hard to, hard to track where the iron went. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here we have quorum sensing. Um, I don't need to say too much about it. Basically, we have cells at low density that produce some kind of inducer molecule. And when they get to higher density, the inducer molecule crosses some kind of threshold. And both the inducer and uh, the resulting behavior of that, uh, you know, th that's, that inducer stimulates could be public goods. So the ecosystem level consequences of this, I think, um, are potentially pretty broad as well. <clears throat> These uh, quorum sensing molecules could potentially coordinate enzyme production among bacteria or fungi that live in the soil or the or the ocean, or the, and then we also know that they uh, 
are involved in the invasion of host tissue by pathogens so they can control the movement of carbon from living plants into you know, dead, dead biomass as well. Um, and as we heard earlier, they can help to trigger biofilm formation or cessation. And, and here's the, <coughs> the, be the basic schematic of the biofilm again, where the polysaccharides that hold the biofilm together are the public good. And this is a, an ecosystem now where we have gradients in terms of nutrient availability and maybe oxygen availability, but also potential dangers to being on the outside of this biofilm where antibiotics may be coming in or grazers may be coming in. So it may matter where you are in this, in this biofilm and uh, how the public goods payoffs are playing, <coughs> playing out. Now, if, you're, if your substrate's coming from here, then it's great to be on the outside. But if you're sitting on it, if you're trying to decompose a leaf, and this is the leaf, and your biofilm is stuck to it, you don't want to be way up here, because now you're far away from your substrate. So the, the basic idea of a biofilm from the microbes' perspective may be to alter this diffusion rate, the polysaccharides, and allow decomposition to occur more efficiently, and to try to you know, maybe exclude some of the effects of these cheaters, which now you know, can't gain as, as much access to the reaction products. And this is just a nice uh, figure from Paul Rainey's group that shows you know, how we really can get evolution of cheaters within the system. <coughs> so this is the uh, pseudomonas fluorescence biofilm. And uh, here it is. Prior to the in-situ evolution of cheaters and after, and so after then the cheaters actually do collapse the system and literally collapse the biofilm because they're not producing, they're not pulling their weight in terms of polysaccharide production. <clears throat> okay, so overall, you know, I really wanted to make the point that these, you know, microbial economic trade-offs can potentially have big impacts on decomposition and cycling of carbon and nutrients through ecosystems. <clears throat> so, you know, now we see that there's biomedical applications like Steve talked about. It's certainly important you know, from an evolutionary theory standpoint, it's important to the individual organisms, but now we also see it important at this broader level. So these microbes are facing trade-offs and costs that have implications at the ecosystem level. I thought it was also important to, to discuss this briefly, that what this means is evolution isn't necessarily optimizing processes at the ecosystem level, right? This is evolution playing out at the scale of individual microbes and populations. So, you know, the, the evolution of cheater types and various mechanisms and their associated costs that prevent cheating may then result in a, a reduction of the rate of ecosystem processes, such as the, the turnover of carbon or the release of nutrients or the productivity of, you know, the world's oceans. So there, there's, this is kind of antithetical to the Gaia hypothesis, if you've ever heard it, potentially. And so finally, you know, I think that this is further argument that we should really start to think about how to include microbes into these larger scale models that we use to predict you know, things like the trajectory of global climate change uh, because they're really quite rudimentary now. They, don't, they literally do not even always have a box that says microbes you know, in these models, so let alone evolution. I'll be happy to have any more discussion. <laughs> Your pump, your pump model didn't, <coughs> if I remember right, didn't have any zooplankton in it. No. And uh, I, I, my recollection is they're important in terms of the... Yeah, there's going to have to be a loss term for your driving, or something to drive the turnover of phytoplankton. Yeah, we had, had, we had, had aerotrophic bacteria. Right, but yeah, there's got to be something to convert them from live to dead, and then the heterotrophic bacteria can take over. Yeah, so that... That's not totally coded up yet, so we'll, we'll realize all of those, those parameters that need to be in there, I'm sure. Other questions? Well, it's been a great day, and Don's asked me to, to, to take a, a few minutes of, uh, of discussion on, on this and the other topics. And, and I, I hope one of the things that people have learned is that uh, <coughs> The, the people in different communities are uh, mainly the ecological and the socioeconomic communities are addressing similar problems but in different ways. And maybe a lot of it we saw in terms of the, the discussion around Steve's point as to um, uh, whether we can think about these things simply in terms of, let me say, management. There are certain objective functions, uh, utility functions that we want to maximize. 
uh, we don't worry about, uh, well, it's not that we don't worry about whether uh, you could get there by a natural process, but it's very much a top-down approach. Uh, and it's, in fact, close to uh, the mechanism design. You might argue that uh, uh, we, we had in, was that last year or the, last year, yeah. uh, the year before? Uh, namely, you know what your outcome that you want. Uh, I could go from Ted's talk to even asking how might I design uh, utility functions in order to achieve certain objectives. And Steve's points, which I think, uh, and I think I've convinced him, are that, yeah, but um, a bottom-up approach would never get you there. Is that, is that fair? I mean, if a, a true evolutionary approach is basically a bottom-up approach where you put types into competition, you have some sort of dynamic natural, we have the standard one in natural selection, uh, and that may or may not take you to, uh, to these uh, ones. And this, you know, this is a problem that comes up in um, evolutionary theory all the time. Uh, the simplest models, we didn't, nobody talked about the most naive models, which are from evolution, which are optimization models. You know, people often talk about optimizing this or that, and that, that requires them guessing at the beginning what it is that natural selection ought to maximize. And those models almost always go wrong because um, there's no reason that what you're guessing they ought to be maximizing is what should be maximized. And those things that people usually choose for them to maximize are a lot like utility functions. So I, I see some of the debate as, uh, uh, as being a top-down versus a bottom-up approach. Is there, uh, if, if will, the system, will the system left to run by itself um, get you to uh, what you might want it to do or what you might think it should be doing from a top-down uh, approach. And maybe some of that is also re related to, uh, uh, to ideas of free market versus uh, management of systems. So I thought I'd throw that out there to let uh, people disagree with first. You're, you're not smiling, so. Well, I, I, yeah, I would say probably what you said slightly differently, which is, my, I guess, trying to use your language, what I said was that evolutionary dynamics imposes a very narrow type of utility function on the problem. But, but as, it, as, as an economist or a mechanism designer, you're, you have a much wider range of utility functions you can legitimately look at. Okay, I mean, that's another way. That's what you said. I just Yeah, I, I would say it a different way, which is that evolution isn't going to maximize individual utilities. It's going to, it, it may, maximizes a very certain narrow type. If, if it maximizes anything, but at least it's not going to lead to the well, that's, increase. That's a bit of argument, yeah. is that, yeah. that that's what gets maximized. It, it stated in the natural selection until uh, it was mm -hmm. in sort of um, Yeah, the reason I'm, I'm tripping over that is because of these notions that fit, that, it, that when, once one puts in frequency dependence, maximization only, and maybe this gets you to the marginal things, maximization only occurs uh, in the sense that the types that end up there have higher fitness than other That's nearby right. types That's right. might, might have. It, and, and, and in general, so I mean, th th that's a fundamental problem in a lot of evolutionary, a lot of evolutionary arguments is that the simplest way, but it's deeply flawed to think about how, what evolution is doing is that you have some landscape with different fitnesses associated with it uh, and evolution's taking you up, taking you up hills. To peaks. But in reality, under frequency dependence, you don't have those peaks. Uh, evolution, uh, if, if you reach a, uh, thank you, Avinash, bye bye. If you have a, uh, that, we're losing all of our economists, so we'll, <laughs> we'll be able to move more easily now. <laughs> uh, if, if you have a, a view that systems are more or less in equilibrium, um, you reach a, a mean fitness of zero if you're in continuous time or one in, in discrete time. And then as new mutations occur, you just move along ridges, uh, basically. Uh, so the idea of maximization <coughs> at least has to, be, uh, has to be revised and you have to think of it very, very locally. Yeah, the alternative is what you had in that uh, device table model. You have multiple equilibria and now the equilibrium has been sort of the first thing shift the balance. Of different in some models you, 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 know, you, you, you get that sort of coming out yeah. but um, but most of the problems I can think of in, a, uh, in evolution that are that are really interesting are ones in which frequency dependence is a very strong we have frequency dependence by, by stability right mm -hmm. where you go initially depends on on initial conditions 
but now in, in a spatial model, the blobs are different are different states and they're competing with each other at the margins, right? And one's producing more output than the other, so some blobs tend to grow at the expense of other blobs. Basically, because the within blob dynamics are turned off, and it's the between blob, it's the it's competition at the margins that's, that's determining what the metapod is. Right, but but so one of the one of the limitations of the approach that is generally taken in economics is you assume you have a known strategy set. And you're maximizing on the basis of that. Whereas evolution is always producing mutations in, in directions that you can't predict in advance. So you, so you have a constantly changing strategy set. And um, so a lot of these analyses, that, like what I presented, you know what, you're dealing with a fixed set, and therefore you reach an equilibrium. Now suppose something's coming along to perturb that equilibrium. Either, either environmental change, which is changing the fitness landscape, or else <coughs> new mutations, which is changing the fitness landscape, but due to frequency dependence, basically. Uh, so then, then what are you doing? You're, you're, just, you're, you're basically always in equilibrium. You're not climbing. So they, then, but on the other hand, the, the idea of climbing fitness landscapes makes sense if what you're doing is designing drugs or designing um, uh, jet engines. You have, you have some, some range of, and, and I, mean, I gave those two examples because this has been used for both of those. You have some um, range of possible genotypes and you have a fitness associated with each one of them and you're trying to, and probably plant breeding and animal breeding gives you the same thing. You're trying to find your way along that surface uh, to the peak. But the time scale is short. Right? Uh, right. But that's, but that's in a sense a, 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 a designer approach versus uh, a, a, an evolutionary approach. Anyway, that's just one thought in terms of the sorts of uh, problems we're dealing with. Uh, we had a lot of theory. Uh, it would be great to, uh, to get some data for these sorts of things, but you're, uh, you're involved in that for these sorts of things. But uh, for, for lots of the, uh, the, for example, for the sorts of things that, Rama, uh, that uh, Avinash and I are interested in, getting the relevant data are problematical. And you, might, you clearly have the same problem any mathematical modeler does as well. If you're going to do a behavioral economics experiments or an anthropological experiment, you create a model system, even if it's a real community. And now you've got the problem of how do you extrapolate uh, in my view, is you make the models give you qualitative information, and then you help them with use those to understand the more complicated world. I don't think an anthropological situation is going to have any chance to actually get a hard ground. You try to explain the major axis along which things yeah. vary. Well, it wasn't so, it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you have to have models to think clearly, but, but uh, I mean, if you're not. Kind of worker, it's just so much more complicated than any model. Yeah, when I said model, when I refer to model here, I don't mean just a mathematical model. Mm -hmm. I mean a, a, a doing an experiment in a laboratory, or mm -hmm. uh, including a, a behavioral laboratory. And mm -hmm. and the question is not just can you get the parameters, but can you create the uh, can do you, are, are the conditions in the laboratory always artificial? Uh, and uh, uh, taking out of the context in which things have evolved. Maybe a question for your presentation is what would be the, and to me these models are valuable if they tell you, well, in this one, under these circumstances we expect a lot of warfare, and under these circumstances warfare should be rare, under these circumstances uh, certain types of cooperative structures will emerge, and under these circumstances the conditions simply don't favor it, and there's one dimension that really explains the shift from one kind of behavior to the other. And it's sort of at that level. That <coughs> at, at, in the social phenomena where the, where the models tend to have the greatest power, it's a little hard, maybe, maybe it's just because I can't remember more than an hour ago, but I, 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 which could be true, you know, but it was a little bit hard. I mean, the models that Avinash presented were, were fairly detailed, specific things about, but trying to extract out of that what would be the main dimension that you would well, well the, set of, the set of questions that you raised is, is one um, class of things you could get out of the model. The other is uh, to ask the question, um, how can I manipulate um, the, 
the pro-sociality or things of that sort to achieve certain objectives. So the one would be the synergism. Well, the one, the one is the approach that you typically would take, and I usually take, which is trying to understand why things are the way they are. But the other is to say, we don't care why things are the, are the way they are. How can we, how can we change the system to, to, to guide it towards particular? Closer to mechanism design. Yeah, it's, it's, it's close to a mechanism design. But the question is, what is the, what is the primary axis along which your models are telling you people should focus on in terms of changing the system in order to move the system? That's a critical to problem. State. That's right. A critical problem. Yeah. If you're going to be able to solve the control problem, you yeah. have to understand what you're trying to control. So what you're saying is absolutely right. Yeah, no, I know that. I'm asking a more, I'm asking a more pointed question, which is that that Simon and Avanches okay. talk was very was very focused on specific issues and it covered a range of these problems. I guess the one I would take away, but I'm asking you the question mm -hmm. is, is the interaction between the efficiency of individual behaviors in relation to um, the public goods level or group level phenomena. That was a, a sort of you call Avanches uh, called complementarity. But yeah, so the complementarity is... That's the one I took away. I'm just asking if that's an accurate that description. Of everything. First of all, Avinash described this. It's very much work in progress. So we don't know all the answers to the questions. But, but, but I would say the focus is on, A, um, if, you, if you think about pro-sociality as, uh, uh, as a control parameter, something that, that, that you can manipulate by, through taxes and other incentives, what would be... Uh, I mean, this is in addition to the understanding aspects of it. Yeah. Um, uh, what's the sensitivity of the system yeah. to that parameter? What's the sensitivity of the system to uh, uh, to the topology of interactions over which you might have some control? Um, and um, and then there's the question you raised, but at, at, at this point, it's it's more of a uh, um, of an empirical question for me, which is. Um, can you classify situations, and this is like, Bernie made some points on this before, can you classify situations according to how the public pool, the public good, will uh, complement and affect um, the payoff functions to individuals in terms of the, their utilities? How do I benefit from clean air? The, the, these, I think, are the crucial empirical facts. We start out, we start out with a function which was x times uh, a plus bx. Uh, right now we're looking at that Cobb-Douglas thing, but, but the additive case, which is, <coughs> I guess what he would call non-complementary thing, which is you get a certain, uh, like in, in Ferris experiments, you, if you keep money for yourself, it's yours. If money goes into the public pool and it's divided up, it's just added on. To you, and that affects your, your utility, but that's a, very, that's a different kind of uh, thing. So, I mean, the answer to that is going to depend on the problem that you're dealing with, and I'm wondering whether the four boxes in terms of rivalry and excludability is what uh, is the way you would begin to classify that. Actually, I think that's somewhat related to Steve's picture, which he called Simpson's Paradise, which is the standard way to draw that is uh, if you actually take into account the synergistic growth patterns that can occur when you get a group of things that work well together, the size of those groups can be much more explosive than the you know, sort of simple model that I do myself, actually, when you look at cheaters versus cooperators. But you actually get a synergistic set of things working together, and then you put in the time dynamics, which is a sort of compound interest problem, but the size of the groups can be dramatically different depending on, on small permutations of initial composition, whereas the typical way to do it Somewhat different sizes for the groups according to the frequency of the initial types. When you actually put in a growth dynamic, the sizes can be vastly different. Which is to and some extent that's the whole cost. Which is some, to some extent a, a re restatement of what Simon just said about you know if you divide up the public good, but it's just kind of like you get your share of one over m of a good which isn't really growing synergistically. Right. So a lot of the key is to understand the synergistic. A lot of, absolutely. I think that too. Just give you. He's just giving you, you know, about the Simpsons paradox. I made a statement that it occurs. Oh, a beautiful example is in the year 2001, the state of California, what they did is they had this program to judge pools for how good they are. And if you have, you have two ethnic groups inside the school and they see how, you know, the reading map abilities of this, uh, 
of uh, group A and group B this year, and then they compare it to group A and group B next year. And they will reward the students if the students do much better and the aggregate is better. You just add them from one year to the next. 70 schools, 70 schools in the state of California. Each of the ethnic groups did better this year than last year, but their overall performance was much lower, and they were in jeopardy of being taken over by the state. <laughs> and that is, so state, state, that is precisely right. Simpson's parents. So the state built in a ridiculous structure. Yeah, they used they, the ridiculous structure was statistics. It was simply adding. Right. It's not ridiculous, it's just adding. It's ridiculous at that scale. <laughs> well, no, it's ridiculous in the sense you have to understand uh, the statistical paradoxes and just try to right. there, There's another level of that, by the way, uh, which is to give you an example. One of my students did, a, uh, uh, did her senior thesis on um, practices in, in the panda regions in China for, for encouraging environmentally friendly activities in terms of not cutting down bamboo. And things, and, and what they did is they rewarded each household a certain amount, equivalent of two hundred and fifty dollars, if they took certain actions. Uh, and what do you think was the uh, immediate uh, uh, outcome of that program? Not sure. It was a, a big increase in the number of households. Households began to split. <laughs> if there were multiple households, they could get the two fifty twice. No, yeah, of course, that's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> But, but uh, she documented that. That's the problem with mechanism design. Uh, and, and, and that's the that's the problem at Yasa, that, or was the problem at Yasa, because at Yasa, which is this organization in Austria, <coughs> uh, the, the director was, was giving a certain amount of money to every program. And there were certain programs that should be consolidated. Uh, but consolidation would have cost them that money. So that, that if, so that's why in, in, in my I, we, we tend to think of the topology as given uh, and think about the, the cost and benefits and what's going to happen with that network. But, uh, but the, it, at least equally important problem is how do groups form and break and how do networks form and break uh, is particularly in response to these, uh, uh, to these incentives. But for lots of, of small scale societies, I think it's not so bad Way more important in particular mm -hmm. interaction you're dealing with. So, you know, you're going to eat with your, your clan no matter what. And, and then if there are assholes, then you're stuck with them, right? And, and, uh, so, I feel like other creatures, it's a bad assumption. And modern society is probably a bad assumption. But, but uh, I think it's kind of, I think the human evolution is not such a bad assumption. Take the uh, empire. Can I ask a slightly different question? Can I ask uh, maybe different people, uh, uh, for example, like Bernie. Bernie, you're a political scientist. What did you get out of listening to the bi uh, <laughs> biologist, evolutionary people? You might want to ask somebody uh, from uh, uh, the other side. No need to be polite. Yeah, don't be polite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, as, I, as I said in some, some of my earlier uh, comments and uh, questions, uh, I found Behavior of human beings mimics the behavior of, of slime molds, uh, microbes, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And insofar, uh, I want, and insofar as one can be much more precise and run experiments on slime molds and microbes, then it ought to be possible to generate real insights that actually do transfer to to, to, so, to social behavior. So that was the sort of first. Uh, Sort of most powerful idea that, that, that I got from the economists. And then, in fairness, the, the, in terms of what I learned from, um, from the economists, um, is that there are some economists who are not actually trained at the University of Chicago. That was a very, very important piece. Was that a new one? That was a very important piece of information uh, because uh, it, it suggested that there was the possibility of a, a I, I never call myself a writing correspondent, or I was a reasonable choice. There was the possibility of reasonable choice, that is to say, the application of standard economic tools in ways that would not lead to 
ridiculous conclusions, as in, for example, rational expectations models. So that would be the second uh, main thing that I have. How about uh, the third one? What did you get from other, other from others outside of your discipline? Uh, I was most interested in uh, the talk by Hobbes uh, and Ted about thinking about this way of the other elements, thinking about sort of the dual problem of what utility functions you might maximize and how that does or doesn't fit with, uh, especially like Ted's talk about the different wall systems and how to uh, what formalize those as. One of the questions, one of the questions I posed to uh, to Ted off offline, but maybe you'd have some insights on it, is could you take a model that was structured in which you had different small communities that had different golden rules, um, and uh, put them in competition in some way, to to see how these golden rules might evolve? Sure. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, you have to specify a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, you have to specify what the payoff to individuals in the group is because it can't be the utility. But one, I mean, one thing he didn't talk about that's obvious but probably would lead to rather trivial consequences is just in the well mixed thing, put individuals with these different golden rules in competition, you know, let them play each other. Don't assume that they're playing the same game. Well, the more selfish strategies will win out. But in the structured model, you, uh, um, you, you could give the group some, some benefit function. And you have to have some way to keep, keep everybody from going back to just paying attention to own things. So you need, you need kind of implies that there was a business story in back of this thing, which really is part of, he just wrote down the utility function. And well, at the end, he was talking about uh, about um, uh, the folk down, and it's like, you know, which one was good. Because unless you have something like that, selection in a well-mixed environment is going to take you right back to, you know, R equals zero or whatever you want. I mean, uh, there has to be some reason why you care about other folks. Norms are important in that it's hard to create the, 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 the laws and taxes unless the norms of the society support it. That's right. And so the laws kind of add, you know, what do you do with the 5% of sociopaths and deviants and stuff that they're just going to screw up no matter what. And, uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, there's this great book, I'm sure the book is not just going by the bottom of the book, but the book is not just going by the bottom of the book, it's called Order Without Laws. How people regulate cows, fences, and stuff like this is just a big thing. Laws have nothing to do with this. It's all custom. And I, that's for sure true. Right? the efficiency of individual behavior and that that was something that they were looking at and focusing on and that Ab Abhinash mentioned that you know most economists don't that seems to be ignored and then Bernie made the comment that this was a very interesting thing from a political science point of view and you know, all the models that we do in social evolution sort of have that I mean even the evolution of sex ratios we just have sort of implicitly have that kind of structure to it and so it was just interesting from a almost like Rob's comment, from a structural point of view of the nature of the way payoffs are built in, which ultimately drives most of our insights, that there's very different points of view that come either from sort of implicit assumptions that come from political science or from traditions that come from economics. And, you know, in biology, we sort of think we're just sort of following along the calculations that evolutionary dynamics does, and we come to a whole set of things which are 
um, some subset of the broad range of utility functions that, that come from from political opinion or from economic assumption. And we just have a range of them, which is partly my comment about Ted's saying something was inclusive fitness when it isn't inclusive fitness. It isn't that he did anything wrong. He gave a beautiful talk. I think he kind of over interpreted what I said, which was just that I all oh, my point was just in biology, we just have a <coughs> very specific narrow set of utility functions that we use because that's what's consistent with evolutionary dynamics and we don't consider other utility functions because it's not consistent. But, but Unless you're talking about humans, there's just not going to happen. That's right. And so we just have this narrow subset of utility functions. So it's kind of interesting that you know economists for lots of good reasons or people from political science for lots of good reasons we look at a whole variety of assumptions about how payoffs and interactions occur, which we wouldn't normally consider. Which was probably also my comment about the last comment about Simpson's paradox and something that even in biology we're not so good at. We tend to think about group sizes growing sort of roughly linearly with frequency depending, but in fact there's if you actually follow growth dynamics, there's tremendous nonlinearity which is based very um, sensitively sensitively on um, synergistic processes which we tend to ignore because it's much simpler just to say, well, group size grows with frequency of cooperators. Um, but that's actually not very consistent with ecological dynamics. So we, we think we're doing things consistently with what evolution and ecological dynamics, but a lot of our challenge is to recognize the narrowness of our assumptions about the way, to some extent, the structure of utility functions. We, we think we know how utility functions are structured from ecological and evolutionary dynamics, but in fact, we're just as bad as everyone else. We're sure. picking some tiny subset yeah, of the range of it. So a lot of the insights that come in bio within narrow biology is the recognition that you know you could sort of reduce it to well, we used to think we knew, we would know how to go from nutrient cycling to payoff functions, but in fact, I would say we probably often make that a much too narrow point of view. Yeah, I mean, take take, take Steve's talk. Take 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 about extracellular proteins. Is it really clear? the degree to which you benefit from the extracellular proteins that I put out there. Mm -hmm. you know, we being two different bacteria. Right. Um, you know, it depends, depends on how widely we won't they're build, diffused. We won't build up on that. <laughs> <laughs> how widely they're diffused and things of that. Yeah, well, scaling issues are... Well, scaling scary. issues, but, but even so... I mean, but I'm actually more thinking about the synergistic issues, which lead to large nonlinearities. We tend to walk around that a lot. and. Um, well, we all, and, and, but we know that the, yeah. it's the nonlinearities that are, that are really the fulcrums. We know that, but in a lot of the social phenomena that we study, we, we don't incorporate it as often as we can pay as much attention as we should, I think. And I think For good reason. It's just difficult. And, well, and, you, know, it isn't so, you know, I don't know that that's really it. Well, Part of it is that traditionally you tend to work out things that are a few generations. Yeah. So you're, so, you're but looking the, at local information. The thing about microbial like interactions is that you're often looking at at things that start with small initial conditions and then there's an explosive period of growth over many orders of magnitude. And that's not the traditional social evolution tra um, trajectory. So you can write a payoff function, and I've done this before, where you look at things where you actually take into account growth dynamics and then you look at payoffs as the outcome of growth dynamics, which are um, over many generations where you get vast changes in size and frequency, but we tend not to do that. We tend to, traditionally it tends to be the social animals we think of as large growing slowly over a short number of generations. And microbes are really qualitatively different from that, and I don't know that, although it's, once you think about it, it's not that hard, but traditionally the combination of the complex ecological dynamics is that reshapes the structure of payoff functions this isn't something that's normally considered cost and fully understood. And, and I think that would be really a lot relevant to a lot of the ecosystem level things that Steve's talking about, that there may actually be some really qualitative differences in the structure of social evolution theory applied to ecosystem level phenomena because they're at a different scale from the things we're used to thinking about. So that would be that would be a big insight in biology, I think. How about the Tony, what did you get? That's well, a political again, scientist again. Again, it's the sort of the similar similarities and differences between um, social sciences and biology. I mean, I mean, I was very surprised when so, we talk about the sort of quorum sort of sensing phenomena. This is something that we observe in um, cultural systems, means sort of co coordination, but in a it has not been designed. It's just been completely it just sort of evolved, evolved that way. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure. It seems it seems there's a there's a very sort of 
strong sort of divide between um, um, nat natural systems where things, um, where in some sense what's happening is you're evolving a utility function, and cultural systems where what's evolving is actually more a question of um, equilibrium selection, even within a given, um, given utility function, you have a wide variety of the cultural norm, in a sense, is the, is the, select, is the selection of equilibrium. And you sort of brought up this question of law. That seems to be another. I mean, as a political scientist, obviously, we, we think laws are we think laws are very important. But you know, what is the difference between a law and a norm? Well, laws are codified. You can change the law. You can't, you can't, leg, you can't legislate. You sort of can't legislate a law. And we, we, we're interested in cases where laws get changed, and this actually, within a generation, changes the changes sort of like norms. When we think about democratization, we're often sort of interested in what degree, to what degree is the case when you change the law, um, or you change the constitution within a, is it going to be a case within 20 years that people have adapted to this new constitution or, or not? Are you so, talking about the Supreme Court decision the other day? <laughs> Which may change things in the well, no, no, I was, I, I, I was, yeah, um, no, no, no. There's two senses in which that can happen, right? Yeah. There's the, there's the idea that a lot of people have, which is there's a law and, and there's a penalty, and now you'll obey the law. But I think a lot of it is is um, signaling. So there's a lot of uncertainty amongst people about you know, what it is we all agree to. So yeah. smoking or seatbelt use or things like that. I actually think that the, the effect of the law passing is much. You know, nobody's getting tickets for not wearing a seatbelt hardly, but it, it somehow changes what the default position is and what what uh, people feel free to criticize. And so. Um, I remember my, so I smoke cigars when I go out camping. It's the only time I smoke is when I'm camping. And the first time I went out with my daughter, uh, you know, she's been propagandized in school about how terrible smoking is and how it's against, the, you know, not against the law, but it's, you know, so it's not quite the same. But, but she felt quite free, to, you know, to, to tell me I was doing the wrong thing because there's the sense that that's the norm. You know, so that's now the public state of the norm and people who don't, who want to obey it can change this to sort of balance of power. So, I mean, one night story would be that laws are partly, or maybe mainly, about the focal points and yeah. education, and not so much about the actual penalties that are, because when people don't want to follow the law, like prohibition, they just don't. The difference, I guess the difference is, I mean, you get, when you want something becomes a law, you get rid of the need for the actual norm to be self-enforcing. So you actually have a much broader range of norms that you could actually produce because you have that small amount of external coercion may be sufficient to make something in equilibrium that otherwise would not be. <coughs> could be. So you've got that. So uh, that we saw that with, uh, in the 50s when we had uh, some of the problems with the race and things like that. And the uh, laws, and uh, people changed their opinions, but the laws were still on the books and uh, maintained force and civil rights. Steve. <coughs> well, I was uh, actually. Well, from the, the economist and political scientist, what you get from the social science? I was impressed with you know, the challenges that economists must face with acquiring empirical data. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was bad as an ecosystem ecologist. You know, we're, we're always trying to extrapolate up from a flask to a you know, plot to a ecosystem to the world, you know, that's, that's a big question, a big challenge for us, but to do it with a, you know, I always figure it was kind of the same problem in, in economics and, you know, the, an economy was basically like a complex ecosystem, but I think it's, it's more than that because, you know, there, we, we at least have <coughs> thermodynamics and physical laws that underlie all the processes at some level, you know, it's, it's you know, not a level that we're ever going to see in our lifetime be predictive at the ecosystem scale. But I, you know, human societies are so dynamic and subject to so many cultural factors that, that I can't, yeah, I, I think we have to conceptualize it differently. Of course, ecosystems are subject to human societies. Well, now they are, right. And there's, that's a big coupling that has to be dealt with in both realms now. Which is, I don't know that it has been dealt with Not really well in, in either. Don, what did Simon? You get? What did I get? What I get is, uh, <coughs> see, I'm the mathematician of the group, uh, <laughs> and as a mathematician, I saw one hell of a lot of interesting uh, issues for uh, for modeling and for examining in various different ways. What I truly enjoyed was the uh, similarity among the different groups. Yeah. yeah, there's the differences, but the similarities were striking, and uh, and the opportunities I think for. Uh, 
learning from each other, from more groups. That was one of the first products, right? <laughs> that was one of the reasons uh, uh, for this particular gathering of people from uh, uh, different camps to, uh, to get together. And I'm even more convinced that there's a lot that can be learned from each other. Uh, that we'll have to really explore ways. Now I'm going to put on my hat as IMBS director. More we are going to have to explore ways of, you know, in which we can uh, try to get more communication. Simon. Well, you know, I've been skirting this uh, boundary between the yes. two disciplines for a long time, and I, I was fascinated by the, by the similarities and differences between the two. I think of ecological systems uh, as special cases of eco economic systems where individuals are competing for resources, uh, et cetera, or I think of economic systems as special cases of ecological systems. Either way, um, they're both self-organizing, complex, adaptive systems made up of individual agents pursuing their own selfish agendas. Um, and there are lots of similarities between them, but of course there are lots of differences between them. And uh, some of the major differences uh, have to do with, uh, well, of, of course, even though humans are animals, it's the degree to which thinking about human society <coughs> changes the name of the game because of the ability to make calculations and models and prediction. And also the emphasis on your when you think about ecological systems, or when I'm wearing my ecologist hat, I'm thinking about the questions that Steve asked, how did this come to be, how, how did this evolve? Whereas when I'm, uh, the economist thinks, you know, how do we understand the system enough to manage it uh, with regard to some objective mm -hmm. functions, and how, how do we get to, uh, Ben Bernanke or whoever's gonna replace it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, to you know, how does he manipulate the, the the small? I mean, that's a big difference between the way the ecosystems are organized. So I'm fascinated by the similarities and by the differences, and but what the two disciplines can learn from each other. As Don knows, and Steve commented, I gave a talk here last week on temporal discounting, and I see the temporal discounting and uh, it, that is intergenerational inter equity and intragenerational equity is two complementary aspects of the same, same thing. So I'm fascinated by what I learned from economists and, uh, and thinking about how to couple those systems together. Yeah. You and I have a question. Not too long. Oh, we do. And I have to go to the gym. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Very good. 6.30, right? 6.30.